be continued.
Good morning. It is a joy to welcome you to the house of the Lord as we gather together to worship his holy name and to receive the ministry of his word. Today is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, and today is also the day for the youth to gather at our house at the Amiot's place for games and supper and Bible study starting at 4 p.m. So youth, pass the word and bring your friends. The congregational quarterly meeting is tomorrow evening here at Our Saviors at 7.30. And this is for all of us, all who are members of Our Saviors Lutheran Church, please note this and come to participate in the business and, and fellowship in that way of the congregation. Coming up in July, two more items. One is on the 24th, that's a Sunday afternoon, uh, our Bible College is sponsoring a picnic at uh, Oakland Park in Thief River Falls, and everyone is invited, everyone, including you, is invited for supper in the park and fellowship um, just to support um, our Free Lutheran Bible College, our, a two-year school for young men and young women um, before they go off and do whatever in life God leads them to do, grounded in God's word. Uh, also in July is on the 30th, Don and Sonia Balmer invite you to their 50th wedding anniversary celebration. Note the invitation in the bulletin here at church at 4 p.m. on the 30th. Now, the first week in August, I want to invite you to come to the cities with me. There are at least a couple of us going down to what's called SIT, Summer Institute of Theology. And this is for men and women. It's, it's put on by our seminary, but it's not like a pastor track. It's for men and women who desire to grow in God's word. And there are some of our seminary professors that are leading classes during that whole first week in August. And I just want to plant the seed now. It's not too late to sign up and go down to the cities for that first week in August. On August 21st, we'll have our Parish Day service uh, here at Our Saviors. Um, and you'll notice the offering plates, again, weren't in the narthex today. They are, again, being passed during, um, during special music. The flowers on the altar today are given in celebration of Avis Dirud's birthday this Thursday, given by her children. At this time, we open our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship is Psalm 16, one of my favorites. Beautiful psalm. Psalm 16, a miktam of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand our pleasures forevermore. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word and how in Psalm 16 you draw us to putting our trust in you so that we rely on you completely. You are our portion. We thank you for the blessings you give us in life of, of family and a congregation and a community, and yet they are not everything. You, Lord, are our portion. And so we pray that you would be at work in our hearts through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll turn now in our hymnals to number 398, Rock of Ages.
rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee, the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed. Be of sin the double cure, save me from its guilt and power. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless love to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, Rock of ages left for me, let me hide myself in thee. <laughs> we come before the Lord now humbly confessing our sins, knowing that it is not by the labor of our hands that we would fill, go, fulfill God's law's demands like we sang in the hymn, even if our zeal could know no respite. And we'll hear about that in the sermon today. So we come confessing our sins, imploring God's mercy through Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you, for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your word and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only son to die for us, and for his sake forgives all your sins. To them who believe in his name, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows upon them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand as you're able in honor of the reading of God's word, the Old Testament lesson from 1 Kings 19, verses 14 through 21. Here we see the prophet Elijah near the end of his ministry and bringing along Elisha, who has been his helper, as a more official helpmeet. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 14. And he, that is Elijah, said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria, and you shall also anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mahola. You shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him and was with the 12th. 
Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have, what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxes, oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. The epistle lesson is from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then skipping to verses 13 through 25. Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Now skipping to verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Here ends the epistle lesson. We confess now our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we hear now special music.
seated. At this time we'll turn in our hymnals and sing number 397, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Good morning again. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Bryn, for your special music today. 
thank you to each one who is taking a part in the service and also blessing the congregation with fellowship time afterward. At this time, I invite you all to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. The gospel lesson for this sixth Sunday after Pentecost is from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. Jesus, with his disciples and those who have tagged along from his recent preaching stops, are headed from the north in Israel down toward Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 51. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, this is your word, and your word is truth. We pray that you would sanctify us in the truth. Do your convicting and humbling work on our heart as it's needed, and do your comforting, resurrecting, and forgiving work on our heart as we believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. James and John were two disciples of the Lord who had this thing that is called zeal for God. Zeal is a a fierce, burning intensity for something. They were sincere. They were sincere in their eager dedication to living every aspect of their lives in service to and love for God. That's a good thing. Zeal is a good thing. And then there were three guys, unnamed men, whose zeal seems to have been in question. A couple of them really loved their families. They had a lot of love, and that's a good thing. Love for man is good. But something was not right with James and John's zeal. And something was not right with the men's love for their family. In fact, some of Jesus' strongest rebukes are delivered to James and John and then to the family men. What's going on here? How can zeal for God be bad? How can love for man be bad? And when is zeal for God and love for man good? First, Zeal for God is bad when love is missing. This is the point of 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, where we hear, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Zeal for God without love for your fellow man is bad. Allow me to illustrate. In today's text, 
Jesus is traveling through Samaria on his way steadfastly to Jerusalem. And, and when the Samaritans reject Jesus, probably because they felt Samaria was the right place to worship, not Jerusalem, then we see the zeal of James and of John. Luke 9, verses 51 through 54 says, Now it came to pass... When the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set to go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? That's zeal. The disciples knew they were right. <laughs> they knew the Samaritans were wrong. God would be just to rain down fire on these sinners who rejected the Christ. So let's call down fire on them. Right, Jesus? This is what zeal for God looks like when there's no love for man. In Luke 9, verse 55, Jesus turned and rebuked them. And he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Jesus isn't saying that the fire of judgment is never appropriate, but he's definitely rebuking their speed of the, their conclusion that the Samaritans were beyond saving. James and John really, really loved God. They had intense zeal for defending Jesus. They were personally super offended when people rejected Christ, when people rejected them. They were very quick to anger, and they felt justified in their wrath. They had zeal for God, but it was bad. It was without love for man. And I encourage you to note Acts chapter 8. Read Acts chapter 8 later. It is a case of, of John later in life, once again approaching Samaritans, but finally he has zeal for God combined with love for man, and I bet he was super thankful that Jesus did not rain down fire from heaven in Acts chapter 9 on this Samaritan village which later came to know Christ. Second, love for man is bad when zeal for God is missing. And again, allow me to illustrate using the text. After being turned away from the Samaritan village, Jesus and the disciples continued south toward Jerusalem. And on the way, Jesus has conversations with three men. And it seems to me that these three men recently started following him at one of his preaching stops. They are new disciples of his. Unnamed man number one pipes up and he says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. That's a verbal commitment. That's actually a zealous statement. But is there zeal there to back it up? Jesus didn't want this man to live a life of, of talking the talk, but not walking the walk, the life of a hypocrite. So he shed some light on the zeal that would be needed to accompany this man's love for the Lord. Jesus said in Luke 9, verse 58, foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And there is no reply recorded from unnamed man number one. How would you reply? Would you continue walking with Jesus toward Jerusalem? Now that you know that comfort is not a guaranteed or even a likely part of what following Jesus means. Consider your own comforts today. You love Jesus, but are you zealous enough that if you had to choose between all your, your 21st century, first world comforts and Christ, that you would really let all those earthly goods go and cling only to and follow Christ? We love the Lord, but do we have zeal to accompany love? And then we meet unnamed man number two, when Jesus tells him in Luke 9, verse 59, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. 
but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Seems harsh, doesn't it? At first glance, yes. But look at it again. This is Jesus that we're talking about. So he can see more of what's going on in this man's life than you or I can. All we know is that the man's dad has died. And he wants to leave for the burial. And then, you know, a day or two later, return and follow Jesus. The only way that I've been able to wrap my head around Jesus' words, let the dead bury their own dead, you go preach the kingdom of God, is that in this specific instance, Jesus was calling this man on a mission with him to Jerusalem, and the folks back at home who would be burying his father would provide no spiritual comfort in his grief. Let the dead bury their own dead, then would mean let the spiritually dead who do not believe in me bury the physically dead. Where would this man receive more comfort in his grief? Back with his unbelieving family and community at his father's burial? Or with Jesus on the road who is himself the resurrection and the life? Jesus is not being harsh. Jesus is calling the man to walk with him for true comfort in light of death. He is calling the man also to action, to be zealous, to proclaim the kingdom of God, the gospel which he has believed and heard. Again, there's no reply recorded for this man, so we're left to consider what our reply would be. Love your family. Family is good. Love for family is good. But may I say, family isn't everything. Consider Psalm 73, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Notice, when Asaph wrote Psalm 73, he didn't say, my flesh and my heart may fail, but family is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Family isn't everything. Contrary to the popular slogan of our day, family is everything, it is not. It is the Lord who has given us family in this life. It is the Lord who also gives us Christian fellowship, which is family that lasts eternally. It is the Lord who is our portion, the strength of our heart. Unnamed man number three is the clearest example to me that suggests that these were men who recently became disciples of Christ and had begun following him on the road. It's as if this third man had just gotten into the field of discipleship. He had just started to plow. Luke 9 verse 61 says, And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. It's a small request, just to run home for a goodbye real quick once. But in his own way, Jesus tells the man, keep her moving. Perhaps Jesus was thinking of the dangers of delay. This man was increasing in zeal. He was ready to follow Jesus, even after hearing that comfort wasn't going to be guaranteed in Jesus' conversation with man number one. He was willing to follow even after hearing Jesus urge man number two onward instead of taking a day or two for a burial. But when he suggests that he might go and bid farewell to those who are in his house, Jesus tells him, Keep plowing forward. If he delays, if he goes to speak with his friends and family about his intentions to follow Jesus, will he be able to resist their pleas for him to stay? To stay where they love him, where he is cared for, where he is provided for, where he is comfortable. Or, instead of resisting their pleas, will he have love for man without zeal for God, and turn away from following Jesus. When the Holy Spirit prompts you through the hearing of his word, through the hearing of a sermon, through prayer, when the Holy Spirit prompts you to move forward in faith, following Jesus into what might be discomfort,
but not to fear, because the Lord will be with you. Will you delay? You love Jesus. Your hand is on the plow. You're walking forward with faith in Christ as his disciple. Don't hesitate. With reliance on God, move forward. As my great-grandmother put it, get back to plowing. Listen, if you will, to, to this autobiographical account from my great-grandmother, Miriam Pinkenbinder, about how she grew up without faith, how she faced challenges, and then how she came to faith and then wrestled with how to live with both zeal for God and love for man. This will just take a few minutes, and I think it's worth the time. She titled it, A Field to be Plowed. She wrote it in 2001 when she was 94 years old, and she wrote it for her church's book of senior wisdom. (laughs) Great grandma said this, Studying the Bible was not part of my early life, but my grandfather read his Bible every Sunday afternoon. I never had any church or Sunday school until I was 17 years old. Church was a new experience for me. My little brother died. After the funeral, the the minister influenced my parents to baptize the three remaining siblings and then all come to church. Great-grandma goes on to say, We had no instructions to what baptism meant or what the Presbyterian Church stood for. When I started teaching school, I lived with a family whose only son still lived at home. I had always wanted to be loved, craved for it. The association was too close, and I became pregnant. We were married, but neither of our parents was there with love and support. In 1928, they were disgraced. Great-grandma goes on to say. My husband's family did not go to church either. I knew they had had an early Christian influence. Had moving changed them? I do not know. There had never been any show of affection from either family, never argumentative or loud. I took my three oldest children to Sunday school. They were baptized, as was my husband, at a private baptism at his insistence. The children brought home beautiful Sunday school papers with stories and scripture verses. I was finally persuaded to teach a class, and I learned more. Isn't that how it works? Great-grandma says, My husband didn't like for me to be involved in anything outside the home. He knew for him to object would put him in a bad light. I was taking part in women's work. I went to an overnight Presbyterian meeting. I loved it. Hearing of God's love and his work in the world excited and challenged me. I wanted to be part of it. When I got home, my enthusiasm was quickly squelched. My husband was in the hospital with blood poisoning. I knew that he was thinking I should have been home to care for him. It took a lot of soul-searching to convince myself that it, it wouldn't have mattered, for he was well cared for. He wanted me to always be there for him, and I did feel guilty. But was I supposed to yield to his wishes always? That was contrary to what I wanted out of life. But how do I support my feelings? And my dear great-grandmother closed by saying, By this time I knew some Bible verses, and the one that came to my mind was, No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, verse 62 I went back to plowing. The field was stony, but for the most part, things were eventually manageable. She says, that scripture from Luke strengthened my resolve to accept the call to fulfillment in my desire to follow Christ. Signed, Miriam Finkenbinder, 2001. My great-grandmother was beginning to learn how to have both zeal for God and love for man. James and John had zeal without love, and Jesus rebuked them. And then the three unnamed men seemed to have love, but couldn't come to grips with the need for zeal. Loving their families is good, but to love anything in the place of God is idolatry. What we need is zeal for God combined with love for man. What we need is Jesus The zeal of Jesus was to the max. He he called sinners to repent. 
When they claimed to love God but walked in sin, he didn't say, "Mm, to each his own. No, Jesus rebuked hypocrites. He called them to turn from their sin. And not only his zeal, but his love. His love for man was at the max, too. He called burdened souls to come to him. All who are weary and heavy laden because he would give them rest, and he still does. All who came in repentance, he forgave, and he still does. He healed all who came to him with illness, diseases, demon oppression, even death. His zeal for God was so great that he was willing to obey God, no matter what. And his love for man was so great that this obedience to God took him all the way to the cross, where zeal and love perfectly met to accomplish your salvation. No one before or after Jesus has had such a perfect mixture of a zeal for God and love for man. We are all imbalanced in our zeal to love ratio. Some days we have plenty of zeal and little love. Other days we're fine in the love department and low on zeal. And still other days we have little zeal for God and little love for man. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, help us forgive our sins where we have failed to have a holy zeal for you and where we have failed to have a Christ-like love for our neighbors. You who desire to live with a holy zeal for God and his word and to live with a fervent and God-pleasing love for your neighbors, you're doing something called hungering and thirsting after righteousness. God is giving you these desires for good things. You're failing in some ways, and in other ways, God is succeeding through you. It's not by your perfect zeal that God will accept you. It's not by your perfect love that God will accept you. It's not by your commitment to Christ, by your commitment to your neighbor that you'll be saved. Your zeal, our zeal and love, is imperfect. Thanks be to God that it is by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ who zealously lived and lovingly died and accomplished everything for your salvation that you are saved. As you rejoice in this salvation accomplished for you by Jesus, knowing it had nothing to do with your amount of zeal or love, what's next? How then should you live? Well, Live with the assurance that you are saved by faith in Jesus, not by any of your works. And then, by the grace of God, go back to plowing the fields of discipleship. Don't turn back. Be zealous for God and for his word. Seek to grow in his grace. Seek to grow in the truth we find in his scriptures. Seek to spread his word to the ends of the earth, not just Christ for you, not just Christ for people like you, but Christ for the world. And with faith in Jesus for your salvation, love your neighbor. Give help. Give encouragement. Give patience. Give friendship. Give the gospel that Jesus loves them and died and rose again to forgive their sins. As you remember, Christ's perfect zeal for God and love for you, and as you grow for God, for As you grow in zeal for God and love for your neighbor, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We'll turn now in our hymnals to number 309, Christ for the World We Sing. 309. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, 
the poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn, whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with fervent prayer, the wayward and the lost, by restless passion tossed, redeemed at countless cost from dark despair. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with one accord. With us the work to share, with us reproach to dare, with us the cross to bear, for Christ our Lord. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with joyful song. The newborn souls whose days reclaimed from error's ways, inspired with hope and grace to Christ belong. Please bow with me in our closing prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, who, with perfect zeal for you and with love for us, was obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross, so that through him we have salvation by grace through faith. Lord, in this forgiveness, in this new life, strengthen us. Increase our zeal. Increase our love that we may be zealous for you and loving toward our neighbor. Have mercy on us, we pray. We ask that you would be near to those in our congregation and beyond who are in need of your help. We pray for Oris and for Rachel Dahl, for Duke, for Larry and Betty and Patty, for Chuck and Wanda, for Sarah and Dana and Bev, for Ruby and Jordan and Casey, for Linda Hornseth and her daughter Mary for Neil and Irene and Jan and Rose, for Carol and Gordon, for Julie, for Ed Vandestreek's family. We pray for our servicemen and women. We pray for our missionaries and the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations and beyond, that your word would go forth through them, Christ to the world. And also, Lord, that your word would go forth through us, that you would make us zealous for your gospel and loving to our neighbors. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, closing with the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand as you're able and receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.